Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. I'm outside the walls of the Old City of Jerusalem today during one of the intermediate days of uh, Passover, Pesach, known as Kol Moed, And I'm going on a walking tour today. Super excited about this because I've been living in Jerusalem for seven years. When you live in the city for that long, you kind of don't do all the touristy stuff. And uh, our tour guide today is a guy called Rob or Robbie Berman. Um, from what little I researched about him in the five minutes before joining this, uh, he's an author, he's a freelance journalist, photojournalist, and he's gonna take us on. He recently became a tour guide and he's gonna show us exactly all these interesting sites in the different parts of the old city. Of course, not only is it uh, Pesach or Passover at the moment, um, it's also Easter, so we're gonna visit at the end uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre complex. It's gonna be an interesting time to see the old city with both uh, you know, a lot of uh, Jewish uh, tourists in the city and also Christian tourists, and hope to uh, discover some new places I didn't know before. So we're now in the Gehinom Valley. This valley wraps around the southern part of the old city and meets up with the Kidron Valley, which goes between the old city and Mount of Olives. You can remember that on the Mount of Olives is a huge Jewish cemetery. And I was there yesterday and I saw a kid running through the tombstones. And that's how you can remember it's called the Kidron Valley because of the kid running through the tombstones. That's Kidron. This is Hinnom. They meet together and they filter out to the Dead Sea. There's one other valley that you go to every time. It's called, it's called the Cheesemakers Valley. And it runs from Damascus Gate down by the Kotel. You ever notice you go down steps to go to the Kotel? How come? Because you're in the valley. In fact, the valley is 30 meters deeper. It's 100 feet deeper than that. And that's called the Central Valley. That's called the Cheesemakers Valley. That's called the Tyropian Valley. Hey, hey. That's called the Tyropian Valley. Not a word. Not a word. <laughs> that's called the Tyropian Valley. Why is it called the Cheesemakers Valley? Because they they cheese in the valley. Do you guys ever see Monty Python where like Jesus is on a hill and he says, blessed be the peacemakers and so on another hill says, he didn't have a microphone, he didn't have when a Madonna. So someone says, what did he say? When you're awake. He said, I think he said, blessed be the, the cheesemakers. <laughs> he said, why would you bless the cheesemakers? He goes, you idiot, it's just a metaphor for all people who work in the dairy industry. He goes, oh yes, yes, God bless the people who work in the dairy industry. So we have three valleys that all meet down by the Sawan and filter out to the Dead Sea. So we have... This valley, which is called Hinnom Valley. We have the valley between Mount of Olives and the Old City, which is called Kidron Valley. And the valley in the middle has three names. Central Valley, Cheesemakers Valley, and Tyropian Valley. And they all filter out to where? To my bathtub? To you, to the Dead Sea. Right. You live in Kvartumi, Mamed, Manedumi. Okay. There's one more valley that's here that you you kind of know about, but you don't. It's called the Transversal Valley. It starts from Jaffa Gate and goes down Davis Street into the Shuk. It's called the Transversal Valley because it transverses the other valleys. It's called the Transversal Valley. So now we have the geography down. Everyone know about the watershed line? Yeah. Which gate is, is this? The West Gate or the South Gate? Is this the what? Jaffa. Where, where are the okay, so that's north. That's south. Jaffa is the gate on the west. And we'll talk more about it later. We're going to circle around and talk more about Jaffa Gate. There's a lot more cool things to see there. Um, we all know about the watershed, meaning if I take water right now and drop it in this valley, where does it end up? Dead Sea. But if I go to the King David Hotel and I drop water over there, where does it go to? It goes to the Mediterranean Sea because of what's called a watershed. The way the earth was created, the way the earth moved because it's set down in place, it rises up here, we have now a slant this way and a slant that way. Okay, let's now go subterranean. Follow me. No, thank you. All right, so we're going down um, an underpass. This is fascinating. This is the road that runs beneath uh, Sharyafo, Jaffa Gate. I want everyone, everyone should notice the wall on the left, and maybe someone wants to guess what that wall is. I'll put a link in the description to Robbie's uh, Facebook page. He's a recently qualified tour guide, but this is uh, really, really interesting.
Okay, so we are now standing underneath Jaffa Gate. Typically, when you find a site like this, you're going to find multiple layers of things. It's not always one thing. But I want to point out the wall. The wall that we passed by on the left hand side is not a modern wall. The wall is about 800 years old, that wall. And that wall was built by a Muslim caliphate named Wazim. He built the wall, and then eight years later, he destroyed the wall. Why would he do that? Any, any ideas? Not hoping to do better. Say again? Not hoping to do better, no. He was hoping to destroy the wall that he built because... Somebody else took it. Crusaders are known for... You have a lot of crusader castles. They're known for defending buildings and areas and territories and walls. That's why a lot of crusader castles. Muslims are known for being great warriors when they're mobile, on horseback, etc. So when the rumors came out that there was going to be another crusade, Muazzam thought, I don't want to have them come, enter the city, take over the city, and they're experts in defending a city. So what I'm going to do is going to destroy the city walls. So he destroyed his own city's walls while he was in his own city, and then the crusaders never made it here. That crusade went to Egypt first and never made it to Palestine, so it was for naught. Why did I bring you down here? What's so significant down here? Well, first of all, they found aqueducts that come all the way from Bethlehem that feed up to the pools here using nothing more but than gravity and that would feed then the Temple Mount through different pools that hopefully we'll get a chance to see at least one of them. But what's really cool here is that 2,000 years ago Herod was ruling, we all know about King Herod, King Herod was a, an evil king. He was known as a master builder. His father was a convert. He was an Idumean convert. He didn't want to convert but the Hasmoneans the Hasmonean kingdom went out and forcibly conquered the Idumeans that were living east of the Jordan River. And so his father was an Idumean convert, so he then was born as a Jew. But he, and he, 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 we know he kept kosher because we have the stuff, we know what he ate, things like that. And actually, uh, the, the record said that it was better to be Herod's son, it was better to be Herod's pig, his pet pig, than it was to be his son. Because so he's ready to kill his son, but he wouldn't slaughter a pig to eat. So we know he kept kosher. Um, but who kept Herod in power? The fact that he was friendly with Mark Anthony in Rome, and he was friendly with the Romans, and we had the Romans here. Okay, which legion was in Jerusalem? It was called the 10th Roman Legion. Now the 10th Roman Legion had a name in addition to being the 10th Legion, that is, whenever you have a battle, and you really do well in that battle, you wear it as a pride of honor. So you are called the 10th Legion of Beersheba, because you had it right. So they were in, in Rome, they were in Italy, and there was a straits of water between two land masses, and the 10th Legion did very well. So they were called the 10th Legion Fratensis. Can everyone say the word Fratensis? Fratensis. Fratensis. And that means the straits. So we're going to find, and I'm going to show you through different part, parts of this tour, I'm going to show you. Um, Areas where we see the 10th legion, and it says for tenses, because that's what's the rule here. Now, when you have all these Roman soldiers, uh, what do you need for Roman soldiers? You need food, water, you have about 5,000 of them. Most of them are living uh, in the Armenian quarter. Um, what else do you need? Wine. Wine, what else? They need, Romans are very uh, careful about baths. You need a bath, you need bath, okay? So how did the Romans take a bath? Well, you know how they took off the dirt. Romans would take off dirt, because they didn't have running water, especially not in Palestine. Romans would take off dirt, and they, they would have literally dirt stuck and sweat stuck to their body. They would rub oil, olive oil, all over their body, mix up the dirt with the olive oil, so you get a nice glob of disgusting dirt. And then they would take a striggle. A striggle was a piece of metal, it was a piece of shell, and they would have their bodies scraped, usually by a slave. And that would allow them to get all the dirt off. Then they would enter the Roman bath. What did the Roman bath look like? Well, they have all these fancy names for all the fancy things. The first room you had was called an apoditerium. An apoditerium is a place where you took off your clothing and got naked. Then you would walk into the Roman bath, which I'm about to show you. And you would have what's called a hypocaust, which is like a furnace, blowing hot air from the furnace into the floor. Now the floor in the sauna, the Roman sauna, 
was hollow on the bottom and it had little pedestals sticking up and then a floor on top of it so it would hit you underneath. After that, that room was called the caldarium, it means hot. Then after that, they would go to the frigidarium, which means cold. They had the tepidarium, which means lukewarm, and depending if you want to cool, uh, hot, get hot or cool off, etc., you would use these different rooms. I want you to peek over this wall and you'll be taking a look at the caldarium, the room which is the sauna. Peek over. And if you're short, you can stand on this rock here. And you can see little pedestals of bricks that um, will be used to, for the Schmitz. Step up on the rock, you'll get a better... Uh... This is a uh, common placard you see about here in Jerusalem. The sign behind me says, Only without internet and films can you live a happy life so this is the interesting dynamic in Jerusalem a city with a very very strong 33% according to the last, last status, census data of the, of the Jewish population is considered Haredi or ultra orthodox and in that community things like internet is restricted by kosher smartphones hey guys, move down. Guys, Yo, don't go down. There you go. I always find it Currently, but you can't see them, or things that you're leaning on and you have no idea what you're leaning on. Anyone have any idea what they're leaning on? You're leaning on the gate. Ah, yeah, thank you very much. I am leaning on the gate. I know tonight's show experience. <laughs> what are you leaning on? That's the question. Something historic and ancient. Something historic. Is it part of the old city walls for no. the sixth century? No. 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 Well, how do you know that? The type I wouldn't of stone. ask. Another reason? The type of stone. <laughs> the type of stone. What else? Where it's it's lower. It's lower and out more. It's out. It's jutting out. It doesn't really seem to fit in with the rest of the wall. It fell off. So what you're looking at is a wall that's connected to the story of the Crusaders. The Crusaders in France in 1094 one of the popes gave a rousing speeches saying that we need to free the Holy Land from the infidels. It took a few years to get their act together. And in 1096, they had the first crusades. It was called the People's Crusade, also known as Peter the Hermit's Crusade. They weren't very successful. They were really a bunch of scoundrels. They just wanted to drink beer, steal money, steal property, have their way with women, and kill people. So they never made it out of Europe. They just basically went to Worms, Spire, killed the Jews, burned the Jews, raped the Jews, stole from the Jews, and that was the first Crusades. They didn't make it to Palestine, they didn't make it to the land of Israel until the year of 1099. And they come basically down this road, like from Jaffa Road, because they're coming from the port. And they make it to, we call this now, Tancred's Tower. Tancred was the king of, uh, at that time, who was trying to conquer the old city from the infidels, from the Muslims. And uh, the problem was that they are used to conquering cities by building siege ramps and by building these siege towers and by building these siege battering rams. And what exactly are these things built out of? What are they made out of? Wood. Made out of wood. Is Israel known for its wood? Yeah. No. So they didn't really have much success. The only thing they could do with this wood that they could find was to make ladders. They would tie ladder to ladder to ladder and they place it against the wall. Why do you think they place the ladder against the wall here? Look at the topography. We're basically at the highest point of the old city. Why would they want to attack the highest point of the old city? First of all, you're higher on the outside, so it's easy to get in. But what's another reason? Once you get in, it's all downhill from there, literally and figuratively. It's all downhill from there. You can charge downhill, and you have the upper hand. So they took their ladders, they placed it against the wall, and the first crusader to climb the ladder made it to the top, and whop, he had his arm cut off that was holding his sword, and his arm and the sword fell to the bottom. And every single crusader that climbed to the top got hacked in half, wasn't working, they retreated, they went further east by Flower Gate, which is actually a corruption of the Arabic name, they call it today Baba Zahur, which means flowers, but not the original name, it's called Baba Zahur, I'll tell you about that in a second, and from there, two weeks later, they managed to conquer Jerusalem. What does Zahur mean in Arabic? Zahur means partying, to go out and party. 
Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut. Uh, no, that's an ifta. That's Ptor. That's Ptor. No, it's not the same word. That's Ptor. This is a Hor. Different letters. Um, so why would they call that gate? This is quite interesting. That gate is called the gate of partying because even though they would lock all the gates at night, they knew that some kids would be going out to the bars in Ben Yehuda. Right? So the Sultan knew 500 years ago they're going to be going to Mike's place and all these places to drink beer and have hot dogs. So they wanted to stop it. They wanted to make sure they only had one gate to come back into <coughs> for safety reasons. And that was called about the gate of party. There's only one problem. In Muslim culture, if you leave a window open or you leave a gate open at night, what comes in? The evil spirits, exactly. The devil, the demons, evil spirits. So they had to put a magic symbol. It's called an apotropaic symbol, a symbol which has magical powers, and they engraved it on the gate. This way no demons could come in. What apotropaic symbol do you think they engraved on Baba Sahor to protect them from the demons? Hold out your hand. Very good. That's, 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 that's Koshal Pesach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good, I'm good. There we go. There we go. The first guy to ever guess. You got some? Magen David. Very, very good. Why would they put a Magen David on the gate, a Jewish star, the star of David over a Muslim gate 500 years ago? Does that make any sense? And the answer is just because The six-pointed star was known as an apotropaic symbol for all religions. It was adopted by the Jews primarily in the 14th century in Prague, but before that you can find six-pointed stars in many different faiths, many different cultures. In fact, I went to visit my friend in Germany, Regensburg, and I saw these old buildings with six-pointed stars. I said, oh, was there a synagogue there? He said, no, that's the sign for uh, beer makers. For, uh, for the Middle Ages, beer makers. So the six pointed star had many, yes? Just, you know, you started off at 1099 and yes. now we're at 1700, you said 500 years ago? We're, still, we, we're, we're at the Crusader period, but I want to explain why. The Crusader period, they went to Baba Zahor Gate and that's where they stormed that area and they stormed the old city and they got the, they beat the Muslims. I was explaining why that gate is called Flower Gate because it's a bastardization of the word Baba Zahor is really Baba Zahor, and Baba Zahor means parting gate. And the problem with the gate of parting, where you leave it open all night for the kids to come back from Mike's place, is because of the demons, and therefore they put the six pointed stars. So, what year was it? What year was it? So, this wall was built in 1536. When I when I mentioned Flower Gate, when I mentioned Baba Zahor Gate, I'm just giving the general location of from this wall. But you're right, this wall is from the 16th century, and this wall is from the 11th, 12th century. Good point. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to make our way to the new gate, which is about 150 years old. So I want to say, what, what was your name again? Gary. Gary. I want to thank Gary for his question, a very important question. If anyone... If anyone has any other questions, or if I'm not clear about other things, please, please let me know. Please ask. The more questions, the better. We are now standing at the new gate. The new gate is about 150 years old. Why do they punch a hole in the gate? Any ideas? Why do they make a new gate? Yes. Uh, not a bad guess, but that uh, would be the answer to maybe a different question. But that's not the answer to my question. But it's not a bad guess. Because they needed to get That's what the hospital there told us last week. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're very close. And the answer is, is because in the 19th century, the British came, the French came, they opened the first British consul that we're going to see. And they started building all these hospitals and educational centers north of the old city. And the only way you can get here to the north of the old city is by going out Jaffa Gate, which is that very, very long walk. So if you lived on the inside right here, in the Christian quarter, and you wanted to come to a Christian hospital, I'm just kidding, as one example, they didn't, it wasn't just for that one hospital. It was for the whole area, the whole area became developed. 
uh, French, British, etc. Schools, hospitals, hospices. French hospital. French hospital. So you'd have to walk from here, literally all the way down there, and then all the way back up. So they decided to punch a new hole in the wall. It's called the New Gate. In 1948, the old city is surrounded, and different members of Etzel and Lechi and uh, Haganah, they try to punch through different areas, and uh, they don't succeed in Zion Gate, they don't succeed in Jaffa Gate, and they do succeed in the New Gate. But they get the order to retreat. Why? Because they didn't have any backup reinforcements. No one else succeeded, and they felt that if they went in, they would get slaughtered. I find this to be a little bit bizarre, because I also did some research and found out that the same thing happened at Zion Gate. At a certain point, they did succeed in breaking through Zion Gate, and they also retreated. It's not clear to me why. I need to do further research. not clear to me why. It doesn't really make sense. In this hospital, something happened. We all know that from 1948, to 1967, this was which country? Jordan. Jordan. So you have, look up, you see Jordanian soldiers, you see them? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. And you see the Israeli soldiers up there? Oh, yeah. Kind of? Yeah. And what was in between these two buildings, this, this whole? No man's land. No man's land. So what did you have in no man's land? You had barbed wire, a lot of obstacles, a wall, and what happened? A woman. Oh, you know the story. Oh, really? You know the story. Look at. You mean the woman? No. That's her nurse. Her nurse. Anyway, the story is that a woman leaned over. Her fake teeth fell out. They are very expensive. Thank you very much. The teeth fell out into no man's land. They're very expensive. The woman was very embarrassed. And so what did they do? The woman told the nurse. And the nurse told the nun. And the nun told the doctor. And the doctor told the head of the hospital. And the head of the hospital called the UN. And the UN called the head of uh, forces in Oman. And he radioed the forces in the old city, who radioed the forces of the commander here, and said, there's a woman who lost her teeth, can we do something? So they came out with white flags, and they got her teeth. And there's a picture, this is a story in Life magazine, and there's a picture of Jordanian soldier and Israeli soldier and a nun holding the teeth. And the story goes around that it was the nun who lost her teeth, but it wasn't the nun, it was a woman. How do we know this? Because there's another picture in Life magazine with the woman's name holding up her teeth, and she's smiling like this. <laughs> so that is, now what are these... Uh, what are these palm fronds doing? Is this is this a cup circus coming up? Um, Sunday. We weren't there during hearts. What's another? Ramadan. Try another religion. So Palm Sunday, otherwise known as Passion Sunday, when Jesus, who is some say he was a rabbi, some say he was a regular Jew, came into Jerusalem. welcomed him with palm fronds, saying, Hosanna, 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 save us, save us, etc. And this is because of the Palm Sunday. We're going... Yeah. So they did that around Easter time or Easter No, it's always, it's always the... the so when did they welcome him in? No, the Sunday before Pesach. Why did they do palm fronds? It's a symbol of peace. Symbol of peace. Okay, we're now going to walk into uh, the Christian quarter. Yes. So I know that we have like Hoshana in Judaism. Yeah, what? Like Hosh like Hosanna, Hoshana. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Like, do they also have that in Christianity? Is it the same thing? Does it come from the same place? Or? I imagine there's a connection. There's a lot of connection. Right. Uh, it's not like just. The lulav. It's very yeah. similar, like the palm. We also have connections with Islam. Like, the, you know, Muslims go. They make a journey once uh, once in their lifetime to go on the Hajj. Right. Yeah. The Hajj. The Hajj. So, how do you say holiday in Hebrew? Chag. Chag. But if you know how to if you know how to speak Hebrew properly, what would you say? Hag. Hag. Not Chag. Chag is a ha. Chag. We've lost modern day Jews. Ashkenazi Jews have lost the way. Hey, Kifa. How are you doing? Happy holiday. Are you open? Yeah. I will bring them by. Okay. See you later. Um. Uh. So the so the, the proper the. Say again. 
<laughs> right, so the, the proper way to pronounce it, right, what's the difference between the letter Chet and Chaf and, 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 and Het? Het is not supposed to be a Chet, it's supposed to be a Het. So it should be not Chag, but it should be Hajj. Hag, Hajj. So they have the same thing, the same holiday, the same journey, the Chag three times a year, you go up to the temple, they have once in a lifetime, they go to Mecca to pray at the Kaaba. So we have a lot of things in our religion, getting back to your question, we have a lot of things that are borrowed and shared. Since Judaism came first, so these things are borrowed like typically from, law, yeah, Judaism. right, they're borrowed from Judaism. Okay, let's enter into, uh, can I have a volunteer, one person, preferably a big man, if there is one, to be in the, the last person to be the sweep? As Robbie was saying, what we these days call Hebrew, modern Hebrew, is a very, very corrupted language. We've lost many great letters. The ayin has been lost. The head has been lost. And uh, it's unbelievable that this guy knows it. Really, really fantastic. I personally have difficulty with modern Hebrew because of the fact that so many of our fantastic phonetics that we share with Semitic languages, with Arabic, with Amoraic, um, have been lost. And uh, this guy is clued in, so um, always, uh, always appreciate a, a like-minded soul. What's interesting about this bakery, Abu Abu Ser, Ibrahim passed me by. I don't know if you saw, I said hello to him on the way out. Ibrahim's daughter, Sarah, was in my tour guide course. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that, that he's a Muslim, Arab, who has a shop in the Christian quarter, who knows more about the laws of kashrus, of kosher, than any of the Jews here in this thing. Why? He was the chief baker for the Citadel Hotel for 20 years. If you say anything, any halachic terminology about kosher, he knows it. <laughs> so all of his bakery goods are, co not now, it's Pesach, but all of his bakery goods are kosher, but it's without a heksher. He has no meat in there. He buys all kosher goods, and this is the one place in the Christian quarter that you can actually get kosher food. Is it Pesach? No, it's not Pesach there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. You can join us. It's very good as well. There you go. It's very good as well. Enjoy. We are now in the Christian quarter, and the Christian quarter is known for being, I think, in my opinion, the most beautiful quarter, more beautiful than the Jewish quarter. It is has the widest streets of all the quarters. It has the most natural light of all the quarters. It was developed later in time, later in history. Uh, that's why. Uh, to point out some interesting facts here, so here we have a symbol, uh, an emblem of the uh, Jerusalem, the kingdom of Jerusalem. When the Crusaders came, they had 200 years of rulership, dominion over the land of Israel, land of Palestine. And that, that's their symbol of one big cross with four crosslets inside, and that's a symbol of the kingdom of Jerusalem. That spire over there, with a cross on the top, um, is a, um, a church named, uh, known as Sabidor Church, the Church of the Savior. That's an interesting place because all uh, Christians, pilgrims, who came to the Holy Land to see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the magical church, the church where Jesus was crucified and he was buried, and he arose, they, came, they would come to that church there and give them a little bit of money, and they would give them a little coin that says, you have officially done the pilgrimage. Uh, I don't know if they still do it uh, anymore. Let me ask you guys a question. I love to meet the locals yeah. and allow you to ask questions. Would that be okay with you if I engage the local? Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if... Um, we're all, we're all well, you know what I mean, local for the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not we're a local local. I'm, I'm a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Okay, so we're not gonna, he's not going to be one of the locals with me. Let's continue on down and see if we can find a real uh, local. I'm 
He's from Abba, his name is Abba Kakashi. He lives in the Rehov Shasher at the Chain Street in the Muslim. Yes. Okay, so you know he's in here in the Christian quarter, he's actually Muslim. Ramadan <laughs> There's tourism, everything is mainly okay. Sometimes there are extremists, I guess, on both sides. So there's extremists on both sides that uh, cause problems. Ah, Sirwan. No, David. This is the Ah, okay. Okay. The of the the Ah, he he works for the municipality and uh, sanitation. Yeah, you can see. Yep. Yep. Karim. As we're walking through the Christian quarter, on surface level, it doesn't look so different from the Armenian quarter or the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter. But then you see these uh, Santa decorations, which presumably for most of the year are sitting there, uh, you know, without doing much. But uh, this place is really beautiful to come here during uh, Christmas and the various uh, Christian festivities. Of course, now we have um, Easter going on. Uh, so we're now proceeding inside and um, seeing all these signs for various Christian institutions in the Old City of Jerusalem. The Vatican has a substantial presence here. So you'll see a lot of Vatican signs and you'll see signs for the various other Christian denominations. So this is actually a really, really interesting time. Newgate is very much associated with Christianity. Um, so we're walking through here and um, right now it's actually ironic that despite, if you read what's happening in, about Jerusalem in the news right now, you get the impression the sky is falling. It's absolutely horrible. There is a lot of tensions on Al-Aqsa, but the point I've tried to make before is that tensions in Jerusalem are very localized both in time and place. So although right now there's a lot of disturbances happening in the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, walking through the Christian quarter, everything is pretty nice. As our tour guide, Robbie Berman said, uh, the alleyways here are substantially wider than another part of the old city. And uh, as we just met Abid, the local uh, worker for the Jerusalem municipality here, uh, and he said that everything mostly is fine. So it's interesting this kind of disconnect you encounter in Jerusalem between what you read in the news and what you see on the ground. It is the home of the Latin Patriarchate. You have the Greek Orthodox, you have different Patriarchates. This is the home of the Latin one. It's really, if you go inside, it's an amazing building. Part of it is a church, part isn't. Can you go yeah, you can walk inside. I mean, until I tell you, you can't. But a certain point, parts you can. Here, if you notice here, the symbol, Tau Phi, it is the symbol of Greek Orthodox, of the guardians of the tomb. What tomb would they be guarding? Holy Sepulchre? The Holy Sepulchre, right. Garden the Holy Sepulchre. As we walk by, notice that the houses have numbers on them, but they also have other numbers next to them, and they don't always match because some numbers will put up in the time of Israel and some will put up at the time of the British. And I'll point out to you one where this one doesn't match. Look, this is 12, and what is this one here? This is a 6. What's that number there? Seven. No, it's a 6 in Arabic. Uh, Everybody split the seat. <laughs> Pesach, of course, is also known as a time when visiting Jewish clerics will come to the land of Israel to spread Torah. And uh, we're joined actually in the tour today by Rabbi Mike Lashielski, who's yes. one such cleric who comes from Windsor, Canada, traditionally the stronghold of the Canadian Jewish community, and is really saying he's drawing a lot of strength from his interactions here today. So, uh, really impressive stuff. I want to say a few words because it's kind of noisy down by, ja by Jaffa Gate. This is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at Jaffa Gate, and I'm going to ask you guys a question. Where do the, where do, how do cars come in through Jaffa Gate? They go around the gate itself. But where's the wall? I mean, the, the, the wall is supposed to protect you. It seems to me that the old city walls is missing a wall. Have you noticed that before? So my question to you is, where do you think the wall is? What happened to the wall? When, you, when we came to Jaffa Gate, right, you could walk through the gate at 90 degree turn, or cars were driving in right next to the gate. So it's missing a wall. So what happened to the wall? They took it down. They took it down. Why would they take it down? So cars would get through. Cars go through. Let me ask you a question. If they took down the wall, 
What would you expect to find on the sides of the existing walls? Stones. Money. You, if they rip down part of a wall, what would you expect to find on the walls that are still remaining? Scarring, some kind of scarring, some kind of indication. Different color stone, not smooth, some kind of scarring. But we don't really find that on the walls there. So it looks like the wall was never there. This mystery uh, really perplexed me for many, many years. Uh, and I heard many stories about it. There's a car. And I'll, okay, there's a car coming. We'll have to move out of the way. And um, we're going to take a look at the wall and see if we see any scarring, and then try to understand what happened to the wall and where is the wall. Let's wait for the car to come, and then we'll go down there. We're looking at two hotels. We're looking at the Imperial Hotel, and we're looking at the Petra Hotel. These are two very famous hotels, and they're in, they're in the news a lot. This week they were in the news, last week, why are they in the news? What are they? These hotels were built about 150 years ago. You can see from the bullet, uh, bullet, uh, uh, bullet holes in the Imperial Hotel in the corner, on the side, and the columns. We see the Tau Phi marking of the Greek Orthodox. They were owned by the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, there is a group of Jews that are trying to move to neighborhoods that Jews don't normally live in. And these two hotels, the Petra Hotel and the Imperial Hotel, were uh, owned by the Greek Orthodox Church. And then, lo and behold, a few years ago, it turned out that these group of, uh, this organization of Jews, which is known to be a religious nationalistic organization, all of a sudden showed up with the deeds. So, um, uh, when the Greek Orthodox Church found out about this, they were very upset and they went to the Patriarch. And they said, "Did you? is this your signature? Did you sell this? And it turns out he did. There were accusations that he took a bribe. He was fired from the church. And the church are in the courts trying to get the property back, saying that it was illegally, it was sold without permission from the upper, uh, from the upper echelon. Uh, and we're gonna go and take a look and see what's inside this, church, this uh, hotel here. I would, I would we are that. now in the famous Ooh, Imperial Hotel. Everyone look at the floor. What do you notice about the floor? Uneven. How is it slanted? The middle one, the middle row is up and it's down to the sides. And what is that for? When it rains, the water rolls down. And what's at the very end? There's a sewer system. This was created 150 years ago. Look up at the ceiling and see how beautiful the ceiling is or was. It's like the Sistine Chapel. And if you look inside here, you can see, if you can use your imagination to do away with all the air conditioners, the electrical wiring, the water pipes, you can see it was a beautiful museum. It was a beautiful hotel. Let's walk inside a little further. Which legion did I say when Jesus was here and tried by Pontius Pilate, he was supported by? What legion? Tenth. Tenth legion. What was their nickname? Fenestris. Fretensis, which means the straits, Fretensis. Here we found a Roman pillar, a Roman column. It's not found in situ. It was found in the neighborhood in the, uh, the late 1800s. They brought it here. And take a look at what's written here. Can anyone read what's on the fourth line from the bottom? This line here. Tenth legion. Legion L -E -G ten. L-E-G. Ten. Ten. For fr F-R. For so this is showing, this is the name of the person who was in charge of the 10th Legion of Fratensis. We find graffiti by them, by the Temple Mount, by the under the, uh, the tunnels, by the, by the Kotel. We find a lot of pottery with their stamp, 10th Legion of Fratensis. And what I find interesting about this column is that the Roman column, the base of this, of this uh, um, street lamp, is 2,000 years old, from the Roman period. The street lamp itself, the metal, is from the British period, the British mandate, and the light bulb is uh, Israeli. <laughs> so let's now head our way down. Probably Chinese. Probably Chinese, yes. Yaakov, who is the, wife, the husband of the woman that I said hello to at the Newgate, and he is the grandson of the man who was brought here a hundred years ago to work 
on the Temple Mount on the Dome of the Rock. So he's a traditional artisan. You can buy ceramics in many stores in the Old City, uh, and even in Hebron. A, they're not the original artisans, like Hagobiz, and B, a lot of the stuff is imported from China, and they pretend they make it here. So let's go and take a look at some of the stuff. And they'll just introduce himself. So hey, just this is uh, I got a friend of mine and, and his wife, and uh, just to say a few words about your history. Okay. Uh, the history of Armenian pottery and my family, Karakashian family, in, in Jerusalem. So we go back to 1919, during the British mandate. The governor, Sir Ronald Storrs, wants to repair all the ceramic tiles of the Dome of the Rock. He brings over from Turkey three Armenian ceramic artists. My grandfather, Mirdic Karakashan, was one of the painters. Mm -hmm. Mr. David Onesian was the head of the group. And Misham Balyan was the potter. They leave Turkey during the Armenian genocide, come to Jerusalem, and start making sample tiles. There was an old kiln on the Temple Mount. They repair it and bake the tiles in that kiln. The samples come out very nice, but the local Muslims say we don't want Armenian Christians to work on one of the holiest sites of Islam. They cancel the project. Now, the three artists cannot go back to Turkey because of the genocide. They decide to stay here and open the first Armenian workshop, pottery workshop, mm. in Jerusalem. That's the important point. It didn't, it, this didn't exist before they came. So they founded this art in 1919. And this is one of the vases my grandfather painted. It is the Tree of Life. Uh, it's a very... you see it everywhere. And this was painted before 1948, during the Palestine period. That's his signature. Back then they used red clay, local clay, either from the Negev or Hebron. But they, before decorating, they dipped it in a white slip. A slip is, a, is red clay. So here you'll see finger marks. They just dip it, wait for it to dry, and then start decorating. So now I'm the third generation continuing this art. And you're welcome to see at the studio where we paint. Yeah, we'll take a look at the studio. Two, a couple of things. First of all, Hagop does ship abroad, so if you live abroad, they can ship tables or whatever. Um, I was very lucky in that I invited Hagop and his wife to my house for a Shabbat meal. And I got this as a gift, which is a beautiful gift. I really treasure it. Uh, it's a gift of a shul. It's a picture of a shul, a church, and a mosque all on one thing, which I really think is beautiful. I, I really do appreciate it. It was the perfect gift to send me. It really was. And I want to also just point out, because we have, we're not going to pass by the Madaba map in the car, though. The Madaba map was found in the 6th century in a church in Jordan, in Madaba, Jordan, near, near on Har Nebo, in the Mount Nebo, Nebo, where Moses dies. And on that church, which was actually built on top of a Byzantine church, we see the cardo, and we see the columns, and we see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and you see the steps leading up to the church coming from the east. When we go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre now, you're going to see it coming from the south. Now let's go and take a quick look and see how they do the artwork, and then if you want to buy anything or discuss something or take his card, you can look at the website, you can do that, and then we'll head out. Continuing here in the Armenian quarter of the Old City of Jerusalem with this amazing tour given by our tour guide Rob. He drew our attention to these unusual slanted uh, stone features because they're just kind of sitting there in the corner and he said that what they're actually for, there's well apparently theories as to what they're actually there for. One of them is that to prevent people from urinating in the kind of uh, tight alleyways of the Old City, they would build a rock like this so that there wasn't any space in the corner. Um, on the other side of the road here, there's uh, these strange looking um, windows, I guess, just jutting out from the houses, and he said that these are uh, called in Arabic mashrubia, so anyone who uh, knows even basic Arabic knows that mashrub is a drink, and apparently these little, um, I don't know what to call them even in English, these little kind of um, things sticking out of the houses here, people would, Arab Christians living in this, uh, in the Armenian quarter, would basically put their drinks, instead of using refrigeration, they'd put their drinks in these little capsules sticking out of windows and that would keep their water etc cool and if you live somewhere as hot as Jerusalem you certainly know the importance of uh, having a good supply of cool liquids during the hot summer months so that's really interesting 
And uh, we're here going through, you can see behind me the flags of the Vatican, uh, because we're here over the Easter period, Easter and Pesach are co coinciding this year. And a really fascinating tour, as the description didn't let down, that you can be living in Jerusalem for 30 years and you'll still find things to discover about this fascinating city. So go in, but one minute's blocked up. And it's not the lintels, they're empty. The lintels were empty, they used to have the stations, and that's why they blocked up one again. I'm here outside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem and one of the things you would definitely miss are these bins here and I actually have seen these around Jerusalem, never had any idea what, they're, what they were. Um, Oren, who runs a great website called TravelingIsrael.com, did a great little short video about these so I'm basically replicating his efforts but uh, explain these are actually bomb disposal bins um, but they're all locked now so basically what these were was that during um, times of less certain security in Israel, they'd have these bins and you can just kind of see how intensely uh, secure they are. And any suspicious objects, people would put them inside them. Nowadays, they're all locked and if there is a suspicious object, uh, which you will see happening in Jerusalem, it's called a, um, uh, it's a suspicious object and you'll see the um, bomb ordinance disposal teams called out. Somewhat regularly, the police will come, close off the street and a sapper, that's where they're looking for, uh, they use actually robots nowadays, so they'll send out a robot onto a bus sometimes, somebody will leave their backpack on the bus uh, just because you're some such a suspicious place, the army will send out a sapper and that's what happened nowadays, but I guess in previous times um, when things were less sophisticated, this is what they had these literally uh, bomb-proof metal things, and this is right outside the church of the Holy Sepulchre, apparently there's also one outside the Western Wall, I've never seen it, uh, but this one right here is quite conspicuous, so these are one of the interesting things you'll see um, outside if you're uh, traveling in the old city of Jerusalem. So my name is Robbie Berman, I'm a tour guide in Israel, and uh, Israel is a very interesting place with a lot of different religions, a lot of different cultures, a lot to explore, a lot to discover, a lot to learn, and I invite you all to come, and I'm available to be your tour guide. So it's, uh, I don't have the URL up yet, but I think I'm going to make it the only tour guide in Israel.com. That's what I'm going to make it. I, I have another question. Yes. I, I believe you, you recently published yes. a book. I published two books this year. I published a book on Arabic idioms in the Palestinian dialect. So anyone who wants to learn how to speak Arabic in the Palestinian dialect needs the book. It's called Min Tak Tak. It's Arabic to English and also Arabic to Hebrew, two versions. And it also came out a few weeks ago with a Haggadah, which is a Jewish pamphlet that we use on Passover night to read from during the services. And it's in Hebrew, as well as a transliterated translation of uh, Palestinian Arabic. 